everybody. Welcome to Find My Pass from Home. My name is Jen Baldwin. We are always happy to have you with us on uh, this Wednesday. It's the middle of May. Can't really believe that, but it's always good to see everybody joining in. So as we progress through today's session, let us know where you're at, where you're from, what you're working on. Leave comments and questions in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. And as you can see, I am joined today by a guest. Uh, I am excited to have you with us. Josh, thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. Always fun to come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, Josh and I have known each other now for quite a long time. But for those of you who have not yet seen a session with Josh, allow me to introduce him quickly. Uh, Josh Taylor is a professional genealogist, speaker, and president of the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society. He has been a huge influence on my genealogical research for a very long time. Actually, I have learned a lot from Mr. Josh Taylor. Uh, so it's always a joy to have you on with us, Josh. Thank you very much again for being with us. Um, and as I mentioned, I am Jen Baldwin. I'm the research specialist at Find My Past. And this is a topic that I am excited about today. We are going to talk about traveling and performing ancestors. This is a topic that some of you out in the community have asked us to present. Um, so we're really excited to have Josh on. And I happen to know that he has some personal stories related to this topic, which is one of the reasons why he's been brought on today. Um, so as we get started, again, thanks for joining us, everybody. Daphne is in cloudy Somerset. We always start every session with a weather report, Josh, so I hope you're prepared for that. Um, it's actually beautiful blue sky in Colorado today. It's supposed to be like in the 80s, nice and warm. Hopefully it doesn't get too stormy this afternoon. What's it doing in New York, Josh? It, it is high 60s, uh, low 70s with bright sunny skies. There's no clouds today. Uh, that New York is entering that period of hot, sticky streets in Manhattan. So <laughs> yeah. we're, we're about three yeah. weeks early, but it's, it is, we'll have a week of it being nice, and then it'll be absolutely unbearable. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. That sounds like something. To look but it's sunny. To. We, we like the sun. We like the sun. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, Victoria is with us from Suffolk. Thank you, Victoria, as always, for being with us. It's good to have you again. Ellen is in Roscoe, Illinois. Uh, it's raining there. I'm sorry, Ellen. It sounds like you got the weather in between Colorado and New York. Um, let's see. Karen's in North London and Enfield. Um, Matthew is in sunny St. Albans. Um, that's not a sentence that you hear very often, I don't think, sunny St. Albans. Um, proper catch up later as well. Matthew, thanks very much as always for joining us. Um, but yes, uh, for everybody's benefit, this is of course recorded and will be available on the Find My Past Facebook and YouTube channels uh, moving forward. Um, also, Ellie is in the comments today. Um, so say hi to Ellie uh, if you're with us uh, online and uh, everybody's with us online. I don't know why I said that, um, but Ellie's in the comments. So say hello to Ellie. All right. We have a lot to talk about. Um, so let's jump in. But Josh, can you start us off? I would love to just get a recap. And, and for those who haven't heard it before, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in your performing ancestors and what what's the story there? Right. Give us the recap. Um, so it's it really entirely by accident. So I was doing research on a family line that had been uh, very problematic. <laughs> I was stuck, um, and I actually was after male descendants for a Y DNA test of this particular branch of family. And so I started sort of tracing down the family, and I discovered that this particular family had the the great fortune of having a lot of daughters and very few sons and the sons in the family seem to all go off and do interesting things and i came across one entry in a autobiography that was written of a someone who had married into the family and then left the family we talked about a man named samuel omar kingsley who and all it mentioned was uh, that that you know mr kingsley had become that that great performer ella zoira and had traveled the world and that was sort of my first inclination and i you know right away started to look up ella zoira and realized that ella zoira was a a person but also was sort of a performer uh, the idea is that this, these were men who would who would dress as women and ride horses beginning in the mid 1800s um, and basically fool the audiences uh, because their their athleticism was slightly different <laughs> than one would expect from a from a, a, a female riding a horse, and uh, 
So I first sort of countered this, this man, uh, Samuel Kingsley, and then discovered that he had first cousins and second cousins who were, were actors and actresses, uh, performers, and he himself had sort of married into a circus family from a very, very young age and had spent his entire lifetime in the circus. Uh, he, he basically, uh, he married at least twice that I know of. He had five to six children that I know of. And uh, his father-in-law was a circus owner. <laughs> he, he basically made the, the family his, or the circus his home. And uh, he died, so he was born in 1839. Uh, he died in 1879 in Bombay, India of smallpox. Uh, his, his will is in the records of the East India Company on Find My Past. Uh, I also found his burial in India in, in the records there on Find My Past. Uh, so it was, it was sort of a sort of a fun uh, you know, moment to discover him and the records that he he left behind. Uh, I have found him in Australia, in Italy, in Russia, in China, in India, uh, some hints of him in South America, in Canada, and in, in of course, uh, all over the United States. He you know, spent a lot of time in New York. He spent time in San Francisco. And where he where he married, and and then went to Australia and then India and his son uh, he did, did leave one uh, living rel relative his son uh, actually removed after his death from Australia, uh, removed with his his mother to the UK and and died there in the 1950s. So a bit of a, of a long time period, but all sorts of interesting things about uh, Samuel Kingsley. So his real name, Samuel Kingsley. His real name is Samuel Omar Kingsley. And there's uh, Matthew's already asking, um, how do you spell Ella Zoira? But it's it's two words, right? It's two words. So it's Ella E L L A uh, space Zoira Z O Y A R A. And that kind of actually is a great introduction to really kind of the first tip I would think from a research standpoint is how do you know which name to pursue and and which one he used consistently I guess or did you did you find any consistency in in which name he chose you know it's it's interesting um the the answer to that is you have to trace both personas realizing that a lot of performers will adopt or be given certain nicknames or performing names and um, you know of course, Samuel's big, big ruse and his big act was that he rode horses as a woman better than, than anybody else <laughs> could ride horses. <laughs> and so if you're tracing in a newspaper, for example, and you look for Samuel Omar Kingsley, you will find some things, but you, you won't find a lot about Ella Zoira specifically. But if you look for Ella Zoira, you will find the huge amount of articles and publications because that's what, what he was known about. At the same time, uh, in looking and tracing, you know, him through what you would consider to be, you know, standard records, probate materials, birth, marriage, death records, uh, he fairly consistently is recorded as S.O. Kingsley or Omer Kingsley or, or even Samuel Kingsley in those records. But he does appear on a couple of passenger lists when he's traveling with his circus troupe as Ella Zoira. So you kind of have to put him in the perspective of what activity he's engaged in when right, that record right. is being created. Right, right. right. There's, there's, this, uh, there's this great moment in his life, uh, and I, I am writing his biography. Uh, I'll finish it in 30 years, I'm sure. <laughs> but but there's, this, there's this great moment in his life, which I think really illustrates the, the process of this, where he's in St. Louis, and the newspaper has this huge article that his horse died. And it's, you know, Elizora's horse died. And at the very, very bottom of the newspaper page, there's a note that Ella Zoira, better known as Samuel Omar Kingsley's son, Clarence, passed away of malnutrition in the hotel. And so it's this odd connection that gives genealogical information, but was really an eye opener to me when I'm doing this research in that that performance persona oftentimes takes precedence in how you how you do the research and how you go up, go up, go up about that process. And I didn't even know the son had existed. He, he was nine months old. Right. Wow. And it's just, it's just one of those examples of this, these are the types of things that you'll find out about relatives, you know, not always the most straightforward <laughs> thing. Yeah. I, know, I mean, the that. son's death is clearly like the afterthought compared right. to the horse, the horse right. is the story. Right. Yeah. Right, and, and his, and it's, and it's in the, it's in the sort of advertisement, um, you know, 
theater section of the newspaper. The notice of the son's death never appeared in the death notices <laughs> in, in that newspaper. Interesting. So a couple, a couple of comments, and one I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a couple as we discuss. But Paul is talking, telling us a story about his own Kingsley ancestors. Uh, Victoria, his second cousin twice removed, was an international musician and a collector of songs who could chant in Gaelic and accompany herself on an instrument made from. I'm not sure what that is. The carapace, carapace of a hairy armadillo. I've never heard of such a thing. She traveled the world with traveling players. Uh, amazing pictures of her, and she lived till she was 100. Uh, yeah, that just makes me want to start Googling armadillos, actually. <laughs> and George is saying her mom was um, in a tap and ballet dance group from age three until seven. She was the youngest, and all stopped when World War II broke out, and she was evacuated, so classes did not resume. I, I would have to imagine there's a lot of interruption in that um, kind of experience, right? In 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 right. that in the world of theater and arts, just as, as a general, that any kind of major conflict would interrupt that process. Did the did your research have your has your research gone you taken you down that road? Absolutely. You know, one of the most interesting things, and this is where I, you know, we all go on those tangents. So <laughs> Samuel lived during the time when the Civil War broke out in the U.S. and the circuses in the Civil War were severely affected. In yeah, that of case. course, yeah. And actually, it resulted in him moving his family to Australia and starting a circus company down there. Uh, so he actually left, I believe, the United States for the duration of the of the Civil War mm. uh, and, and went elsewhere. So the flourish of, of the circuses in Australia happened in part because of his, because of the, the Civil War, you know, ha happening in the US. So they simply went, went elsewhere. Interesting, yeah. I. Um... You know, even in more modern times, I was looking at the, um, you guys know I have to bring up the 1921 census. The um, the bartender at the Savoy in London um, is actually in the 1921 census because he left American bars at the start of Prohibition. And he ends up creating this whole craze around cocktails, basically, in the London set um, and becomes infamous uh, as a bartender as a result of kind of, you know, major movement in some other country. Yeah. It's good. I can't get through this without talking about 1921. It's like a drug. <laughs> um, and also, thanks for those um, brand drops of Find My Past earlier. Uh, I did not pre preempt him to say those things. Um. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you can find things on other families through websites. Absolutely. So I, absolutely. I, believe me, when, I, when it was released, you know, the first thing I did was go and find Samuel's son. <laughs> <Who was it? laughs> <Yeah. 21. laughs> and I, I, w I would have to imagine that newspapers actually, you know, of course, tie in heavily. And there are some specialty newspapers for for performers and, and travelers and um, the theater and the movie set. Uh, what kind of newspaper research have you done that in kind of those specialty titles that might be a little bit different than just your average regular newspaper? Right. So, so there's a couple of newspapers that will track specifically performing ancestors, you know, th those in the arts, uh, things like the New York uh, Clipper and others uh, that, that have been published that really, really focus on the performing community. And they're really the place to start. Um, you know, think of these in a way as sort of a trade association newsletter. You know, what's happening with the circus in California? What's happening with the circus in London? And it's how a lot of people kept in touch uh, with, with one another. Um, it, it also is a great, great place for gossip. Uh, you, you have to remember in the newspapers that you are you're really seeing what they wanted to be presented in the press, mm. right? So not everything you see in that newspaper article is going to be genealogically accurate. <laughs> but that is the record that exists about, right. about that, that individual. Uh, but, but the newspapers, you know, things, again, the, the New York Clipper is, is one great example. Uh, I usually start there. You know, you can use resources like the, the British newspaper archive, of course, to find, you know, traces of, of individuals, but also in addition to those sort of looking at the, the local newspaper when they're advertising circuses and performing, you know, troops that come into town is the place where you get a lot of those details. You know, when you find out that those, you know, the circus is in town or this particular show or this opera is in town. And that's when you start to learn about those performing or, or taking part uh, some, somehow in, the, in, that, in that particular entity, that particular act. I would have to imagine then that, um, just to play off of that, that the the knowing where they are 
in the sequence of how they travel across a particular area or country is actually really important. So are you using a lot of map data? Are you are you plotting their their journey? Um, or how do you kind of delve into that that part of their traveling world? So a, a lot of it depends upon the type of performance. Um, I there's actually a place uh, this, there's a circus historical society, and I should mention there's a society for everything. <laughs> I, <laughs> there's a circus historical society of which I'm a member, um, and they they do great things. But one of the free resources they have is actually a map of different routes uh, of, of circuses that includes countries uh, all over the all over the world, and it will give you in a specific time period and specific place where a particular circus company is right so you so you find out that so and so is affiliated with this company you can go to that that particular resource and you can figure out where that 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 particular circus was traveling to and you can start to to put put those pieces together and really you want to trace the the performance and the troop as you're tracing the individual now the same thing goes for example if you're looking for a ballet company you know you you know, you can do research in different performance collections to figure out where a particular group of performers might have been traveling for a particular ballet, and and you can start to to piece together the pieces geographically. And for me, I I build a timeline, and you know, I know that I might not find direct evidence that says, well, Samuel was there, but I do have direct evidence that the company he was a part of was there at that time performing, and that helps me to to put you know put some of those details together. So I will admit that that was a preempted question because Josh shared the link to that um, historical society before we started today. Uh, so I have I have put that link in the chat. I, I took two seconds to glance at this website, you guys. It's incredible. Um, so you know what I'll be doing this afternoon. I don't have any <laughs> circus performers that I am aware of uh, in my family, but I think it's cool. Um, lots of great resources out there. So and, and Josh's point, your your point about you know, there's a historical society for everything. That's really, really right. true. So, um, you know, do a bit of Googling really on the topic itself. And, and so what are some of the resources that you prefer to point people to when, when just getting started, like learning about the history of the circus, the, the concept of the traveling circus as we know it? So, I mean, number one is, is a historical society affiliated with the topic. You know, they usually yeah. have an overview in a journal. Uh, also, just general histories that have been written. You know, go to WorldCat, go, go, to, go to library thing, you know, go, go to Digital Public Library of, of America and look. And there's usually his, our historical journals and articles on, a, you know, a place like JSTOR and, and those resources that will analyze the circus within a particular area or, you know, a particular type of performance. So, for example, there's in-depth studies by a handful of, of historians on circuses in Australia, their development, <laughs> right? How they came, how they came to be. Uh, I, you know, I, I trace an opera singer who was a second cousin of, of Samuel. There are articles that talk about the development of opera singers in California and Nevada, and their eventual move to New York. And that is the, the entry point, really, into discovering some of those resources, because then, then you go to the footnotes. And you start to see the sources they use to, to put together those those stories. JSTOR, you guys know, is one of my favorite sources. Like, I, I can't do a session without talking about that either. Uh, and and your point about, you know, following the footnotes, it's more than just reading the article. It is understanding where that author got his information, because at some point they went to an original source. Uh, they went to original record and, and following that trail through the records is is super important. Um, when it comes to records, though, I would have to imagine that there is, you know, kind of the average genealogical stuff, censuses, newspapers, mm -hmm. probate collections, birth, marriage, death. But there's also got to be some really, really neat ephemera out there about these particular types of performers. Yep. yep. So, you know, one of one of the best things to do is to head to a performing arts collection at a major repository. Um, for example, in New York City, the New York Public Library has the Billy Rose Theater Collection that is an archive of performing arts materials, playbills, advertisements, and, you know, scripts, <laughs> actual, you know, photographs. You know, I, I have a, I have a, a, basically an advertisement of Ella Zoira appearing in Boston that I picked up at an antique fair somewhere, right? <laughs> cool. You know, those types of resources are, you know, they exist. And, you know, ju just because someone didn't didn't live in New York, perform in New York, doesn't mean that that performing arts archive will not collect information 
because they're documenting performing arts in general. Right. There's a there's a circus historical uh, museum and archive in Wisconsin that has information about about him and his family. And again, they're just they're collecting resources. But the ephemera is is endless. Right. The cards, the the etches, uh, the, the, you know, anything that might have been used to advertise the circus uh, right down to actual items are, are things that, that will appear in in these collections. You know, it is it's interesting when you you know, they might not give biographical detail right. <laughs> about yeah. about uh, the individual but sometimes you can you can even find some great things so there's a there's an absolute gem written in uh, Australia that's sitting at the National Library of Australia that is a fictional origin story of Elizoira that was published in the early 1870s uh, and it it basically you know it's genealogically incorrect <laughs> it's all <laughs> information about his hair his background that's just wrong and it was written i believe as a propaganda piece right to try and build up his reputation and yet it, it's this really odd item that you're not going to find for <laughs> for ancestors who were not not in the, in the performing arts right the general it, average farm laborer doesn't really have that kind of thing right 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 yeah. and, and even though it is it is genealogically incorrect and has been been really you know that the source of a lot of inaccurate information it is representative of the types of records and the types of resources that exist. And it was a part of his life. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you, you know I, I think that you, you can't tell his story without telling the story of the sort of fictional part of, of, his, of his background. And I think for those of us tracing performing and traveling ancestors, the invented background, the hyperbole of their life is something you have to embrace in your research. You, you, you can't ignore that. Right. Well, and I mean, it's, it's part of the, it's part of the pitch, right? It's part of how they sell themselves. It's all right. about marketing. So if, if you have a, a, a circus coming into town and there's a famous horseback rider versus a circus who comes into town with some horseback rider, no one's ever heard of before. That's not as appealing. You're not going to sell as many tickets. Right. right? right. And the same thing goes for, for singers, you know, for, for sure. Actors. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, it goes for a variety of, of different types of performances, anyone in the arts, you know, you, that, that sort of, invention and you know you consider look it was 1870 right it's not like they could google and find a wikipedia article <laughs> yeah. to contradict you yeah, know, the story. totally yeah yeah it'd be like researching prince but not understanding that at some point he changed his name right 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 to put us into modern context kind right. of aging right. myself right. slightly <laughs> changing names for celebrity purposes is is not you know it's nothing new <laughs> right yeah <laughs> yeah it totally and, yeah and, and i think that's one of the one of the challenging things to get to get past in research is that you know you can't just abandon one name and go towards another you have to research both because you know these performing ancestors had to also interact as citizens wherever they were living right sure. they were people yeah so you know one of the things that i found out about samuel during you know dur during the pandemic times when i was at home researching uh, <laughs> the the nygnb is indexing records across the state of new york for land records mm -hmm. and i was bored one night and was sort of typing in samuel Omer kingsley and found that he actually bought and sold property in brooklyn had no idea that he had made brooklyn sort of a permanent residence <laughs> at, at a time uh, but he had and you know elizoy was not associated at all right with that transaction but that's right. you know an actual transaction of him during his lifetime because he needed somewhere to, to live at that period yeah you know on the other end of things uh, when he was in australia he formed a circus company that included the name zoira in the name of the business but nothing about kingsley <laughs> in there at all but the only reason i know that it's him is because of the zoira connection and i can i can add it to the timeline yeah it's really interesting and really really interesting stories i mean i could i've heard a lot of stories about zoira over the years i know i'm um, sorry <laughs> no no no. I'm, i love it actually i think it's great um and i remember a couple of years ago going to a, a lecture at a conference actually that you presented on the topic so is there anything from your perspective as an educator in the genealogy world that like is there if if our our audience today walked away with just one little piece of information, what would be the key thing that you need people to understand that maybe makes this type of research different than the average genealogical research project? You know, it really is about redefining how you trace a family. And 
while you want to trace the sort of genealogical or ancestral family, tracing that performing family is key. And you can do that through genealogical methods. You know, when you're looking at the census, you're not looking for a man, you know, a man married to a woman with, with four children. You're looking for the 20 members of their performing troupe that happen to be captured in San Francisco or in Dallas or in London or wherever they might be right. in that census because they yeah. do form families. And, and you know, it's a, it's a bit of a shift, <laughs> you know, and I think, you know, with that, and you said one thing, but with well, that's that, okay. <laughs> that they often, as so many families do, will then intermarry within that family unit. Oh, sure. Yeah. Right. So when you're looking yeah. Cause they're out, the people they're spending the most time with. Right. Right. Yeah. When you, and, and so, uh, you know, thinking of that type, you know, the, you know, Samuel's circus family is just as important to me from a research standpoint as his ancestral sort of biological family in that setting. Yeah. So their fan club, their fan club, fan club strikes again, everybody. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, it, and, and it's, a, that's interesting actually, because like researching their, traveling family, their performing family, you, you apply genealogical methods, obviously, to that. And part of that is understanding the nuances of all of the different censuses that you might be using over the years, right. and over the, the course of, you know, a number of different countries, perhaps. Um, so understanding the difference between the 1911 UK census and the 1910 US census is really crucial, because you might find him in both. Yep. Back to back yep. like that. Yeah. Interesting. Really, really interesting. Um, okay, I'm going to go to some of the comments um, because we haven't uh, touched on those for a minute. Um, let's see. Lots of people sharing stories of their own performing ancestors, which is fantastic. I love that. So thank you very much, everybody, for sharing that. And please continue to do so. I know Ellie's eaten it up because uh, she loves all of this. There was a couple of questions. So I'm going to... Oh, and somebody explained the, um, the armadillo thing to me. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, to, to, I, there, I'm trying to find the question. So just bear with me here. Oh, but this one's cool. Let's share this one though too. Roxanne said, my third great grandfather was one of the ancestors who played multiple instruments and taught. He played violin in the New York City funeral procession of President Lincoln and has a violin that we believe belonged to him. That's pretty cool, Roxanne. That's a definitely that's a neat awesome. piece. That, that's awesome. And, and you know, just to to emphasize, these types of of family heirlooms end up somewhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Right. And I think that's you know that is that's that's a really neat story. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, oh, I posted some links. Make sure you look at the links. Um, oh, the, the story continues. I think she got cut off. The violin was given to my great grandmother from my great grandfather's side of the family, grandson of the third great grandfather. Yeah. Both play the, this is move the, through the family from one violinist to another. I kind of love that it's not just sitting on a shelf somewhere, right. Roxanne. That's pretty cool. Um, okay. Uh, this one is long, but looks interesting. So, so bear with us uh, as we read through this. John Sherritt left left a normal life on the land uh, and took his family traveling with the fairground. I don't know much, but they had a roundabout carousel and the children married into other well-known fairground folks. So kind of mirroring what you were just saying, Josh, about, you know, they find a new family um, in, in essence. The Sheffield archive is a really great resource, which my cousin has used, especially the trade papers that are used to communicate with others. Very detailed funeral reports, adverts for fairs, but you need to visit in person to see the, see the papers. Um, so that's interesting. So are there anything, it has, have you come across anything that's very specifically UK or US or very specifically Australia um, that really doesn't cover kind of a global perspective of this topic, but is very much geographically based? Um, th there are certain archives that are, you know, I think that Sheffield archive is, is a good example of, yeah. of what they know specifically. Um, there, you know, a lot of performing ancestors because because they did travel internationally or they were connected internationally, uh, you'll you'll sort of see those, you know, you'll see those threads appearing. Uh, I I'm trying to think of sort of a specific, you know, dedicated, you know, resource. I mean, granted, there's always a, and this is something, you know, there's always a performing arts sort of mini collection hiding at a public library somewhere that's very localized, right? You know, if you go into to any archive that has local photographs of events. 
right? There, there's, you know, I have found, and this is, you know, this, cause I take, El Azura comes with me wherever I travel. <laughs> yeah. I'll go out and research somewhere and I'll be at a local archive and, oh, they have a, you know, they have a couple of folders that talks about when the circus came to town over the past 50 years. And there's a great local diary entry of someone that saw El Azura perform. Yeah. Right. So, so I think, you know, when, when you think about these more localized collections, any repository that collects local history potentially is going to have information about these performing ancestors when they pass through the, the specific area. And, and don't forget the letters and diaries and sort of, you know, really the recollections, oral history interviews, for example, mm. when people recall seeing, you know, some of these performances. Um, one of the, one of the spotlights for Ella Zoyer, for example, is Mark Twain reported seeing Ella Zoyer perform. And it's actually in, it's in his, his letters. And, you know, while, while that's, that's a famous figure, think about local figures that will leave notes and diaries behind about things they're doing and the mentions of a performing ancestor that could be found in, in those collections. Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, Mark, anything Mark Twain is pretty cool, right? Um, um, yeah. Giving away the entire biography. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I think most of us will still buy the book. It's all right. I mean, pressure's on, though. You got to write it for us to buy it. 30 years, 30 years. <laughs> 30 years. Um, Roxanne missed the New York record collection for performers. Can you just give yep. us that one, one more time? So it's the Performing Arts Collection. Uh, it's part of the of the Billy Rose Theater Collection at the New York Public Library. Okay. So totally. if you if you go to um, the NYPA website and look for the for the the, the Rose Theater Collection, uh, the archives actually at Lincoln Center, um, and it is it is fantastic. It will cover anything and everything. Perfect. And I did plop that in the comments. There's no link, Roxanne, but I just wrote it down um, quickly so everybody would have that. Um, so thanks for asking that question. That's great. Um, yeah. Okay. Still. Um, okay. So here's another question specifically about New York and the and NYPL. Would they be the best place to look for info on New York theater radio performers in the 1900s? Yep. Absolutely. Um, the, the other thing to remember, and this is, boy, there's resources I'm forgetting about. Um, so... <laughs> A lot of a lot of performing uh, organizations that have any sort of a um, an equity organization or a supporting organization that has records can be a resource. Um, and this is NYPL reminded me of this because they hold records of things like the the Actors Equity Association. Mm -hmm. What what we don't realize is that particularly in more uh, you know sort of 1870 and forward, performing ancestors oftentimes had a difficult time maintaining insurance, maintaining proper identification and really taking care of, of their families and organizations like the equity foundation for example paid for the funeral and actually uh, allowed one of one of samuel's you know nieces to be buried in the plot in a, in a cemetery in queens and so these types of associations that you can find records of oftentimes provide some of the the most essential genealogical details you know who is covering a, a funeral cost who's covering a, a medical mm -hmm. expense you know, these types of organizations were important to, to our performing and traveling ancestors and their collections, places like NYPL will usually have a lot of uh, those, you know, th those sort of sort of records there. Follow the money. Follow the money. Right. Yeah. Right. Where there's money, there's documents always. Um, okay, interesting. Good. So thanks. I think that's all the questions, but if I've missed anything, Ellie will let me know. Um, if there's other direct questions for Josh, please do throw them in. Um, so far, that's, I think we're caught up then. Um, so Josh, tell us a little bit more about your time spent kind of in other countries. I know you've done research on Ella in Australia, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and making those connections um, feels like it's pretty labor intensive. And so how how do you, I guess, I guess the first part of this question is how do you start to go, I think this guy actually went international. So the, the biggest clue is usually in the newspapers um, as you start to sort of trace that, that, that company as it goes from place to place. The, the, the other clue is an absence in the timeline. Oh yeah, <laughs> right? right. So, so if you, if you look at, at Samuel's life, there are, you know, just giant gaps in the U S records where he's he nor his performing company mm. seems to appear anywhere 
And then you realize, well, that 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 was his his sort of international trip, right? He went he went to the UK, he went here. And this is why the New York Clipper is actually a really important newspaper because it will advertise the comings and goings of certain companies. But even, you know, ma mainstream companies like the New York Times, if you're looking for someone who's shipping out of New York City, right, it'll note, <laughs> right, that so-and-so company is, is shipping out. Um, and, and that sort of is, is the starting point. And then once you are you are headed to a particular international country somewhere, you know, it's it's about what records exist. You know, the, you know, I, I trace Ella Zoira in Australia the same way I would trace anyone living in Australia. Sure. I'm just tracing he and his and his circus family there. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that some of that timeline work includes kind of the prominent kind of long standing members of his group. Yep. So yep. if you find if you find a gap in the US records for him, then the next step is to look for the other people in the troop in that same right. record collection and right. understand and that there's a gap for the for the entire group. Right. And particularly the the owner operator of the circus, mm -hmm. because sometimes they're the only person that's going to appear in different in different resources. So, you know, if you can figure out who right, who collected the money, who owned the contract and then trace that person, you'll oftentimes find the performing ancestor right along with them. And do you find that the I guess the owner operator would travel as much, but is there often a financier also behind the scenes somewhere? And, and has that come into play? Um, you know, it, it depends. Um, I, you know, I've seen that in a couple of situations though, you know, very often um, it's, it's sort of a, you know, there, there's actually, there's a circus biographical dictionary that, I, that, you know, includes people who are sort of major, major financiers. Of course there is. <laughs> um, but but normally the circus owner is the person also putting the money in in that case or it's a partnership right one provides the talent one provides the money and they would they would work together gotcha um so nicole has asked about prussia um and i don't know if you have any experience here any tips for researching families that come from germany or prussia i know my nan on my paternal side comes from that area who are traveling showmen who worked with stutz family who came from prussia but unsure where to look for records so, I mean, I mean, really there, I would, I would head for any local newspaper publications that might exist in, in that region that's going to be advertising uh, their, to their, their performers. One of the things that, that I have really, I constantly remind myself of is that, you know, Ella Zoira didn't start off as Ella Zoira who had an obituary in the New York Times, right? Ella Zoira started off as Mademoiselle Zoira who appeared as a tidbit in newspaper in a small town outside of Quincy, Illinois. Right now, translate that to Germany and Prussia. That performing ancestor likely started out as a very brief mention in a local newspaper there or a local publication. Mm -hmm. So, you know, look to some of the archival websites and and head to some of those newspaper collections to see what performers were in the area and if you could find a mention or a notice of you know, of, of, of an ancestor or relative there. Do you find that the average kind of routine newspapers um and you you started to talk about this a little you know, a few minutes ago but they cover they cover the information about these traveling performers in a different way um so is it very flamboyant or is there somewhere in there that little grain of truth like we find with oral histories um you know this this is where you ha you have to read the history and learn more about how that paper was interacting with performings you know there, I mean, artists, musicians, performers, actors, the theater was not always seen as the most <laughs> sort of high class worthy. Reputable type of work. Right. I, I mean, you know, I mean, there are, you know, there are newspapers that comment on a particular performing troupe coming to town as a warning that there's going to be thievery and mm. right, that, that it's a horrible thing and they're trying to get it banned. Right. Right. So, so you have to understand the context in which the newspaper is reporting the information. Like, and I know, would imagine that that trends with time, right? That there it does, are, it does. There it are periods where they're, you know, it's really, right. really evil. And then there are periods right. where like, yeah, it's okay. Right. It's pretty right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's all, you know, it's all reflective. It also is very, you know, sometimes a, a newspaper will include information about performers as a gossip section, right? I mean, think of, think of the, think of the modern day version of celebrity gossip <laughs> and <laughs> right, then scale sure. that back to 1880. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, those sort of little tidbits, those, you know, all those teasers, you know, the, the, the it, it's like the, I, I hate to say this, um, but it's like the, you know, the TMZ version of what was there in 1880, 
right? The sort of illicit, you know, type of gossip about public figures that people would read and go, oh, that's so interesting. Oh, I, you know, I saw them ride a horse last year in this town. I mean, those are things that that you see. And so, but you you do have to examine the newspaper's perspective, Mm -hmm. at least when you're when you're doing research there. Which I mean, really, we should all be doing anyway. Right, right. Right. Because right. newspapers are owned by individuals and individuals have biases and right. yeah, um, political agendas and so right. forth. So yeah. Um, so good overall tip for everybody uh, in newspaper research, um, generally speaking. So cool. Good. Um, yeah. So I would imagine Joseph's comment, I would imagine this is pretty consistently common his maternal grandfather performed in New York City Theater Radio in 1936, um, and they changed their surname um, to King to help get into show business. I would imagine that that type of thing is, I mean, you've talked about it with Ella as well and Kingsley. Um, have you ever come across a situation where they, their name was just already pretty good for show business purposes and this didn't really pop up? Or do you think that this is generally true for just about everybody? So, so I mean, I mean I've certainly seen cases where they right, remain the same, right, right, where, where they sort of keep their name, but typically it's because it was a, it was a more marketable name. Mm. Madonna, share. Right, right. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, you know, Ella Zoira changed, right, Ch- you know, use that as performing name, uh, though never, and this is the interesting point, uh, never actually legally changed his name. He was always mm-hmm. Samuel Elmer Kingsley. And, and in fact, he was sued for false identity in, in New York in the 1860s. Uh, for having a double name, you know, so so you, you have to. That's actually another avenue to look at. It's when people are <laughs> are going it's, after things, yeah. you know, <laughs> aliases and people are known as, particularly when you're looking at naturalization documents, right? If someone can only be identified via an affidavit by a performing name, sometimes that ends up being right, being being part of part of that document. Um, but but normally you. Yeah, you, you do see a lot of name changes. You see name adjustments and shifts. You see nicknames, mm-hmm. and, and you see names that are reflective of you know current you know current feats, right? You know different. You know if, if someone is if someone is particularly tall, <laughs> right? They might break into incorporate tall into the into their name. It, th- those types of, of avenues. Um, So Victoria's got a question as well. This is a fun one. My English great uncle is rumored to have been the copyist to composer Barry Gray for many years, working on the famous Jerry Anderson puppet shows. Would love to find out if this is true. How can I research the people behind the scenes? Right. You know, so the first thing I would do is I would see if there are, you know, if there are papers or materials related to Barry Gray that have been given to an archive somewhere. And I would actually start there to see what evidence you can find of your, your great uncle. And in that case, follow the money, right? You wanna file different different account books and payments that might've been made. You also want to follow any contracts, right? Things that might've been written or agreed upon uh, between individuals. So, you know, if someone is is working for someone else, you know, how was, how was rights, how were rights handled? How, you know, that, 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 how was compensation handled? So those are, are two things that you can look at, but I would start seeing if, you know, if there are records of, of, of Barry Gray, uh, sort of business financial records that might exist or in a, in a company or a promoter that, that actually worked with, with the individual or, or other avenues. Yeah. I, I would, I mean, you know, generally speaking, famous people have more materials left behind. Right. And, and there, and there are particular archives that collect information. Um, so, Right. So it slightly goes outside of, of, of you know, composition, um, but th- there's a, you know, the, um, and my mind is blanking on the, <laughs> on the university. Um, it's in Austin, Texas, but it has a, a very large collection of sort of screenwriters and directors that has a lot of papers there. Any guilds like the Screen Actors Guild, uh, those are going to have, have resources in addition to production studios. You know, you know, for example, Fox, you know, Fox movies, Fox Searchlight has an entire archive and archival team with photographs and contracts and resources. I mean, it's 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 amazing when you start moving into the age of, of you know, movies and film and moving pictures and, and music, you know, even right, you know, recording agencies that are going to have records and unreleased information, you know, just think about all of the versions of the album photograph that never ended up on the album. Oh yeah, sure. Those yeah. are stored somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Right? That's a and, good you know, example. I, I mean, I've I've been in the um, I've been in the Fox uh, movie archive researching, and 
you know, looked at pictures of celebrities and, you know, here's the one that was picked. And then here are the 50 that were rejected with the personal notes from that celebrity on the back about why they were rejected. <laughs> right. And, and you think about that, even for, for someone who might have, you know, been present in the 19, you know, 1930s, 1940s that had that type of PR created, those, those, those materials still exist. I mean, I, you know, and I think that's generally true for just about every major industry, right? I, one of my favorite archivists is actually the archivist for Levi Jeans Company. I follow mm -hmm. her on social media because her stories are fascinating, right? right. And it's the story of a brand, but they have an archive. Right. And so definitely would encourage kind of learning about the industry that they're in, the the company that they're involved with. And, and you know, we, I, we've said it a couple of times now, but if you follow the money, you're generally going to find the records. And I think that's true for just about every occupation. Um, great. So I think that's all the questions that I've seen come up in the chat. So thank you all very much for participating. Um, Josh, any, we will have a few minutes left. Um, any kind of closing words of wisdom or, or any particular part of Ella's story that you really want to tell this, like your favorite part of what you've discovered about his life and, and um, his world. So, so I'm going to start with sort of, you know, closing encouragement, and then I'm going to tell my, my favorite, my favorite Sawyer story in case you all want to go off and do your, do, do your own thing. Um, <laughs> but I will say one of the things that I just continue to relearn and rediscover is do not get caught up in keeping and finding the genealogical record only when you're tracing a performing ancestor. You will find that by broadening your search and actually reflecting their right their their entire life i mean you will it will change the way that you that you do research so think you know think about their life as a performer and trace that not just the birth marriage death type out you might find that eventually but don't don't lose sight of the of the greater performing story and so the so my my Ella's, I have so many fun stories. About <laughs> um, but I, one, one of the interesting things that I am still researching is, so when he was performing in Italy, um, he allegedly had attracted the attention of a particular Duke who uh, found favor with, with him, of course, while he was performing. And uh, it, was, it was revealed that he was in fact a man and there was apparently a brawl and a fight that occurred um, and he was he was very nicely asked to leave <laughs> to leave <laughs> Italy, uh, dur during the period. Very nicely asked to leave. <laughs> I love the story because the story got reprinted in newspapers around the world. And sometimes Italy became Spain <laughs> and the country changed. I have still not found any grain of truth to that story. I don't know whether it was an exaggeration that was placed in the newspaper for PR purposes mm -hmm. or whether it really happened. But when I get to Italy to do research, <laughs> I know when this company was there, that's going to be my focus to see is there any truth of this sort of nugget that, you know, that appeared. But it really just goes to, to the fact that what happened in one location spread everywhere and was in the newspapers for three years. Wow. That because story had some took, legs on it. Well, it took that long for the story to get from place to place. Sure. And it was just interesting enough that it was good filler. Right. When a newspaper would need to fill, you know, a, a certain amount of space. And, you know, Ella Zoyer, I think, made great just, just filler material. I mean, even after his mm -hmm. death, you see him pop up every once in a while. Someone mentions, oh, yeah, you know, there's a horse rider in town, just like that old Ella Zoyer. So I mean, that's one of the fun things is that he still sort of, He's around <laughs> in, a, in a lot of cases. No, I just, it's I, a, I love it's a long legacy. That's that's yeah, great. Right. Um, and proving yet again to everybody that uh, newspapers do not necessarily follow geopolitical borders by any stretch. They had to fill their columns just like they have to fill them today. Right. Um, yeah. And for people who watch regularly, they know that I say that a lot. So yeah. I'm keen on that newspaper search that doesn't really have a boundary to it. Uh, it's one of my favorite things. Right. Okay. So um, I think that covers most of the questions I had. So thank you again, Josh, very much for, for being on with us today. We really appreciate your insights and, and your time and expertise on this topic. Uh, you're welcome to come back anytime you want. Um, oh, thank you. It's been, it's been fun. I, you know, I love to talk about Ella's so it's, yeah, it's, it, it was it definitely I, an easy invite to send. Yeah. <laughs> it's it, it also, you know, the other thing is I just, I know we, you know, we're wrapping up. I don't want to keep people too long, but like 
he has no living descendants, right? There's no one who's going to tell his story, but someone researching his life. Who and might I think, or might not be writing an autobiography. Right, right. <laughs> you know, and I, and I was reading the comments through and noticing some people mentioned, you know, uncles and cousins that aren't necessarily direct relatives mm -hmm. who have these amazing stories. And it's, you know, a performing ancestor might not have people around to do the research and to remember that aspect of, of their life. So please, you know, keep that in mind <laughs> as, as you do the research. Well, and I would have to imagine too that it's a bit of a black sheep in you know in the in the period in which they lived, right? Maybe the siblings and the cousins and the other relations didn't want that family member to be remembered, right. and so they're intentionally forgotten out of the family right. story. I mean, this man had forty plus first cousins. Oh, and none of them ever talked about it. Four, that's a lot of cousins. I mean, I mean, you know, that's that's the. <laughs> So it's one of the joys that we get to do, yeah. that we get to pursue their stories, but also a bit of a sense of a responsibility of telling those stories and making sure that, that that's preserved. So yeah, it's an important important concept to, to walk away on today and, and leave us. So a lot of thank yous happening in the chat. Um, thank you all very much for joining us. Um, uh, happy that we were able to give some of you some ideas and some inspiration possibly for your um, for your research as well. A couple of comments on, on my genes archivist uh, for Levi, that's good. Um, yeah, so find the, those topics that interest you, whether it's your performing ancestor or, or some other nuance of humanity, right? That, um, that will give you kind of this interesting and insight research. And even if you don't have someone like this in your tree that you know of, just find someone in the newspaper and play around and see what you can find, right? Find an article about a, a circus who came to your ancestral hometown and see what you can explore. And, and delve into and that experience, that moment in time, and what your ancestors would have experienced, but also what what the performers would have gone through, and and they're part of that that story, that situation. Thank you again, Josh. Um, always a pleasure to have you with us. If you have not, and he has not mentioned this once, um, kudos to Josh. But if you have not looked at the resources of the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society, I highly recommend it. Uh, I am a member. I have been for a long time. It's a fantastic organization. If for nothing else, read through their publications because they really are a huge essential part of, of genealogical research in New York and biographical research as well. Um, absolutely check out their website and see what they have to offer. They have a big conference coming up um, this fall, which is very exciting to get back to in-person and virtual events. Um, so take a look at the NYGMB where Find My Past has been a proud partner of the NYGMB for a long time. So we're always happy to share resources there. Thank you all very much. We will be back on Friday. I don't remember who is on this week um, for Find My Past Friday, but we have new records, some of which I've been playing with already. They're pretty fun. I will give you a heads up. There's um, a, a little bit coming out of Wiltshire this week. So that's your... Mm -hmm. Uh, your exciting little hint for the for the new releases this week. Um, enjoy your day, the rest of your day. Have a nice evening or day wherever you're at. And we will see you on Friday back here on Find My Past. Thanks so much.